Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry Delacy, and I am the board chair of the Board of Trustees for the Center for Spiritual Living White Rock. It is a genuine pleasure to be with you here today. We are so happy to have the very talented Linda Kidder as our musician today. Linda has performed in a varied number with a varied number of artists, including K.D. Lang and Bon Jovi, while traveling across Canada, the United States, and Europe. She has played at venues such as Albert Hall in London and the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York. Her talents do not only lie in singing. Linda is a bass player, drummer, sideman, lead, tap dancer, oh. session <laughs> singer for jingles and, an el and album projects, songwriter, vocal coach and theater performer. What an incredible, well-rounded performer we are so fortunate to have in our midst. Let's give Linda Kidder a warm welcome. Thank you, Sherry. Let me just say that when I do tap dance, it's more of a comedy routine than anything else. <laughs> You say you know me like you know me. Maybe you do, but you don't. You spin around me, in and out of me, telling me things that you won't. Ah.
Oh, Linda. Love you, love you, love you, love you. Thank you. <laughs> what a wonderful performance. Linda, Thank can you. you please put your contact information in the chat for us so we can connect with your beautiful music? Thank you. I sure will. I'm pretty sure you have some CDs we might want to get our hands on. Or, or where can we find your music? Yep. Thank you. Okay. And now I offer a warm welcome to any first-time guests. It is always interesting to know where you're zooming in from. So if you'd like to put that in the chat, that would be awesome. We'd be able to see how far and wide we're, we're leaving from today. As we begin our gathering today as settlers on this land, we are honored to live and operate on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. We thank the First Nations who continue to live on these lands and care for them along with the waters and all that is above and below. At CSL White Rock, we are an inclusive spiritual community and learning center. We teach spiritual principles and offer tools to use in all areas of our lives and on a regular and consistent basis. When we live by principle, life flows easier, choices are clearer and seeming miracles are everyday occurrences. There is wonder in every day just waiting for us to live it. So let's start today. Okay, so far I've cried three times already today. Me too. <laughs> The first with the introduction from Sherry that was just so beautiful and Jill's meditation and your song, Linda. Wow, my heart is just flowing, 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 full of gratitude and, and love for everyone here and for this community. I just first of all want to say I'm so excited to be stepping into this role and, I, and I'm going to start crying again because how perfect is it for me that my dear friend, Reverend Karen is speaking today on my first day that it's announced that I am the spiritual director because Karen was one of the very first people that I announced my dream to that one day <clears throat> that I wanted to become a minister and that I wanted to walk this path. And she has been with me this whole journey through. And so Reverend Karen, she's been a minister since 2008 herself serving first in Kelowna and Vancouver. And most re recently, she was an interim minister for CSL Edmonton South. She's a former journalist and gifted speaker. She's presented at three of our Canadian New Thought conferences, as well as our SOAR 2021. She's a professional journalist for 20 years and regular contributor to Science of Mind magazine. And she has a deep passion for social justice and the power of visioning to bring community life through personal transformation. And I just feel so grateful that I can call Karen a cohort, a fellow colleague, friend, and she has been this traveler of spirituality with me for the last several years and her guidance and wisdom that she's brought to my life has so much meaning to me. I just am beyond grateful for her friendship and her companionship. So I'm so excited to, I, I need a new word than excited, but I'm just thrilled, 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 thrilled to uh, welcome Reverend Karen Wilson. Oh, I am, um, okay, number four <laughs> for crying. And I got, I got in tears with the dogs too. I'm such a big dog fan, but um, I really want to just extend my heartfelt um, appreciation for the board and its brilliant decision to invite Tamara into this, you know, very sacred role and to be supported by home office um, with some of the best people that I've come to know so incredibly well. Um, you are in such amazingly good hands. And so I'm absolutely thrilled for my dear friend Tamara and equally thrilled for the community because um, this rocks. <laughs> So just saying, just saying, I, I, it couldn't be better. So I'm very, very happy. So um, 
thank you too for the beautiful words that were spoken. Jill truly inspired um, to pick that passage from Ernest Holmes that was just fabulous. And uh, Linda, so beautiful, those words. And I really loved, it was one line that really hit me in light of uh, the talk that I want to do today. And that whole piece that you had about the, um, in the song about got a right to even though like a jury and judge says you've got a right to hold a grudge oh man do so many of us get hung up on that one um so i think i'll just start there I, it was actually came into my contemplation this morning i had a vision of um, the scales of justice and not terribly surprising really because uh for two very pivotal reasons one is that my um, father is a lawyer so the scales of justice was probably one of the first things that I was told about, maybe even in the crib for all I know. <laughs> and the second thing is that I'm, uh, if you follow astrology, I'm a Libra. And um, the Libras are, are gifted as being the only one on the entire chart that doesn't have any connection to some kind of living creature. We just get a scale of justice, right? Um, and so it's been a constant theme of mine to try and figure out balance, to try and um, move through my tendency towards judgment, um, which can make uh, forgiveness very difficult and moving closer into the concept of discernment as opposed to judgment. And also to find what I would call the middle way like when you have the scales of justice and you're trying to figure out, is there a right? Is there a wrong? What's really happening here? There's this literally weighing, right? And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And certainly through this pandemic, oh my goodness, have we seen a lot of this? You know, we've seen it in our external world. Um, you know, we've seen it in politics. We've seen it on the ground. We've seen it in our homes right, where we've been um, spending lots of time with each other and sometimes trying to figure out where is that middle ground, where is that middle way. What I've noticed for myself is that the middle way, and this is so homesy, and of course, the middle way is always, always, always led by love. So whenever we're in that place of judgment, whenever we're in that place of getting really locked into i'm right the other person's wrong what are we going to do if we just ask that question wait a second don't i believe in love what about that we start to at least hear spirit speaking back to us in a way that we can start to maybe listen a little bit more deeply it doesn't mean we have all the answers i don't know that any of us are really expected to have all the answers we're just expected and called to have the answers that are right for us as individual ideas individual expressions in the eyes of spirit that's what we are so what is right for me and where that calling comes for me is not going to be the same as it is for you but if we are all moving towards that bigger idea of love and a bigger idea of our expression of love and keep coming back to that practice throughout our lives, every time we reach these little blocks that we come up against, then we continue to do that beautiful walk, that beautiful path that just opens up in ever greater ways. Um, and we know that Ernest Holmes, towards the end of his life, he talked about the veil being so thin. And it's not like the veil just suddenly showed up and was so thin in that moment. The veil is always thin. And again, it's love that helps us to really break through to the other side and start to see that, that it's all right here. It's all right here in this moment. And we're human and it's not always easy. So. It's interesting that we would have, and it's kind of neat that Tamara would be wearing that heart because the other thought that I'd had was that we were just last week talking about the power of love, right? We were talking about Valentine's Day. Some of you in your homes were celebrating it for yourselves or you were celebrating it with your special loved one. For me, I know I made a point of inviting my daughter for dinner so that I could express my love for her. So there's 
tons of different ways that we were engaged in that practice. And so for us to come into this concept and this conversation about forgiveness after we've already opened that portal for, for love is exactly the way it always works. So when we're open in that place of love, we have a greater capacity to be able to engage in the practice of forgiveness. So forgiveness really is a decision. And it's a decision that we deserve. And I'm going to share with you that it's not only good for our mental and emotional health, but it's also good for our physical health. There's all kinds of things that it does for us in ways that we maybe aren't even aware of. So from a science of mind point of view, human forgiveness is the process that frees us to live in the eternal now. It's essential that we forgive ourselves and others before spiritual growth can flourish. For it's through forgiveness that we free ourselves. So as you move into that, we can feel the spiritual growth happening right away. It, it's an expansive thing. Just in the last week, I had um, you know, a little bit of a challenge with my partner, who I love very, very much. But I'd gotten myself into a mental state where I was feeling resentful and I was feeling um, put upon. He's had a um, Achilles tendon that's been torn and it's not painful, but it's a big deal because he's been on crutches now for five weeks. And so we can't go for walks together and he can't really help with anything around the house. So, you know, I the burden has shifted, you know, we're very good about sharing stuff. And now I'm taking care of all these things. So I was feeling heavy about, you know, how long this was taking and how much work I was doing and how I was trying to juggle all these different things. And that I ever wanted anything different for him, of course, I want his healing, but it wasn't exactly in a place of compassion, right? And so I had to move myself into a place of forgiveness and recognition that what's the highest value that I have for our relationship? Of course, it's that I love. Of course it is. I have no doubt about that. And as soon as I did that, the energy that was attached to all this other stuff that was so ego-based just fell away. Like in seconds, it fell away. And so Even with simple things like that, where you actually do know that you love somebody, sometimes it's hard to kind of bring that to the forefront. And reminding ourselves and being in a place of self-forgiveness, as Jill talked about so much, is also an important practice. Because the self-forgiveness is is, uh, a pathway forward. And everything, everything always begins with self. So to not forgive and to hold grudges is to misuse spiritual law. And it's a rejection of the oneness principle of all life. So we tend to erect an insurmountable obstacle to our spiritual progress if we hold old grudges. And those mountains, they can get pretty steep and pretty big. But they can come down just as quickly. Here's a quote from The Living of Science. The mind says, God's nature is generosity and forgiveness. The universe has nothing against us and only desires our well-being. I'm gonna give you another story which you've probably heard many times, but you might not have heard it in the context of a forgiveness story. And this is the Cherokee story about the two wolves. So there's a Cherokee grandfather and he's talking to his little grandson And uh, he wants to tell him about these two wolves that live inside of us. And one of them is filled with anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, lies, and ego. And the other one is filled with joy, peace, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. And the child asks, which wolf wins? And the grandfather, of course, says, the one you feed. If you look at that list, that he offers up, filled with anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, lies, and ego. Those are usually the things, the emotions that we have that crop up when there is actually a call for us to forgive. We're usually angry because somebody has done something or said something that we don't agree with or out we feel like there's been an affront. 
we're jealous because we have some sense of ownership that we believe maybe that, that you know we should have that and somebody else doesn't. These are sort of like the regular, I think Dante referred to them as the, you know, the seven deadly sins, right? The flip side of each of these is joy, peace, hope. All of these start to come forward when we are in a state of forgiveness. But I think the most important one is that one of humility. Because when we learn humility, when we start to really experience humility, we start to see, oh, oh, I missed the mark there. Here I was pointing a finger right at the other person and there were four pointing back at me saying, oh, maybe I need to be a bit more humble. I know that this pandemic has been incredibly humbling for me. It's um, made me and invited me to get to know myself so much deeper, so much more in a way that I really didn't before. I thought I did. And I'm sort of looking more um, closely at the little nooks and crannies that need a little bit of extra care and a little bit of extra healing, a little bit of extra self-forgiveness. I can also tell you that it helps with issues like pride. Pride is a big one. And if we uh, pay attention to things from the point of view of pride, like I'm not going to bow down to that. I'm just going to just, you know, say my piece and be done with that. And who am I to forgive that other person? Who am I to walk into that space? And as we sort of let that go and realize that this isn't actually about the other person at all, this is about who do I want to be? How do I want to live my life? Where do I want to come from in my life? Then I start to look at it differently. So many years ago, when I was going through some conflict with my father, um, I was living in Kelowna at the time, and he lived down here. And he would phone and, you know, it would come up on the voicemail, right? I would see him. And as soon as it happened, because we were in conflict at the time, my heart would start beating like seriously beating and sometimes I would even get handshakes because I was in such a state of conflict with him and yet I knew I had to pick up the phone right and so I started to do some work on that and what I started to do is rather than lift the phone up right away I took a few deep breaths and I just centered myself in love at that moment and all I did was say hello But you know, the way that I said hello, mindfully said hello, was different. And it opened a window without actually having to say anything. It opened a window of opportunity that brought us closer together. It wasn't that complicated, but there's an energy exchange that takes place. And as we begin to heal our own hearts, that openness starts to open doors that we perhaps thought were shut long, long ago. The other way of looking at it is something that is shared in the 15 commitments of conscious leadership. And what he, they talk about there is they talk about the drama triangle. And you're either in the drama triangle or you are in presence. So that's what I was trying to do was to bring myself present to the moment. In that moment, all that had happened was that the phone had rung. In that moment, all that had happened was that I knew who was going to be on the other end of the phone. Nothing else had actually happened in that moment than that. And so I was able to respond directly to what was right in front of me. So what happens in the drama triangle when you're not present is you move into this place of hero, villain, or victim. And you often are moving around places of action without consciousness and moving into places of blame, et cetera. But when you're present, the hero, instead of saying, let me do everything on my own, the hero becomes the coach, the villain becomes the challenger, no blame or criticism, and the victim becomes the creator, more in a place of self-empowerment. So the dynamic has completely altered into a place that's more open. So we can give our forgiveness into when we are in one of those places and shift into one of these different ways of looking at things. 
The other question that sometimes comes to me is what about situations that are really challenging? What about situations where, like right now, there's a big dialogue going on in this country about the protests that's happening in Ottawa? And, you know, I'm glad Tamara mentioned that I was a journalist because sometimes people wonder why I talk about this stuff as a minister, but I can't help myself. <laughs> I can't help but sort of try and bring my spiritual practice into what's real and right in front of us. And in my own household, um, we're not always of like mind on many political issues. We actually are of two different uh, political belief systems. But we practice in our household um, an openness of conversation, an openness of being able to hear the other side. And sometimes that is difficult, but having an attitude of forgiveness and allowance creates a space where we're able to have courageous conversations that we otherwise might not be able to have. There's an organization that I just learned about today called um, Life After Hate, and it was founded by former extremists in the United States. And their values, key values among them are compassion, empathy, integrity, and accountability. All values that we have as well. And he talks, there's a pamphlet that's available to talk about having courageous conversations with those we love. And it's what to do when a loved one sides with white supremacists. And it talks about how to keep the channel open, not to shut it down with black and white thinking, either or polarized thinking, but to keep the channel open. And how we can do that by inviting questions how we can do that about showing that we care for the whole person, recognizing that there is a whole person, which is, of course, spirit right in front of us. And who do we want to be in that moment as we open that up for those people that we love, who maybe we are not seeing eye to eye with at the moment? The other question that I sometimes get asked on the issue of forgiveness, and this is maybe the toughest one of all, is so what do we do if we're injured? How do we forgive the person who has done an extreme act to us or to a family member? How do we forgive, um, you know, when bad things happen to good people, that, that whole line? How do we deal with that? And what do we deal, how do we deal with the situation where, you know, classic case of, you know, somebody's been murdered or someone has experienced sexual abuse? This is what I know about this, is that this is the self-forgiveness piece of it. It's not to make us a victim, but there's an opportunity sometimes to make friends with the injury. Instead of denying that we are injured, if we make friends with the injury, we go into that space and we ask it what is there for us. So in some cases, that can mean a whole bunch of things. Um, in the case of sexual abuse, it could mean that you have a real conversation with yourself about the impact that it's had on your sexuality and come to peace with the sexuality that you now own as a result of that experience. And with time and or not, you know, the love will open up that for sure. But the or not part is maybe there is a window into forgiveness of the other, but there doesn't have to be. It's about expanding that compassion and that understanding and going as far as we can into the injury that we have, acknowledging it, not being fearful of it, and giving it permission to exist in our lives in a healthy way so that it supports us and we can move and transition through that experience into something greater. I know that there were cases in BC, one case in particular, um, where a young woman in Victoria, 13 years old, so she was a teenager, she wasn't even a young woman yet, was murdered by a group of, of children. And uh, Rena Burke was her name. And her parents made a decision right immediately to forgive. That was a conscious decision that they made, was to forgive the act of bullying that had taken place. That's a huge thing. And not only is it a huge thing, but neuroscience is now indicating that 
the act of inserting something like that as quickly and as efficiently and almost as surgically as you can in the moment of the actual trauma will reduce the future possibility of PTSD. It's like a circuit breaker. So the mind moves into a place of forgiveness before moving into a place of recurring um, injury, recurring agitation, recurring um, memories, triggers, all of that kind of stuff. That wasn't talked about so many years ago, so many centuries ago when we began discussing forgiveness. And yet, of course, spirit knows. And we know because we can see the power of forgiveness when it's within us. I'm not saying any of this is easy. It's not easy, but it is a possibility. And it's a possibility that creates those courageous conversations, those reconciliation circles that are happening and continue to happen. I wanna give you an example and it's a really old example, but for some reason it was like the scales of justice showed up in my contemplation this morning. And this one showed up too, which was quite bizarre. Um, and it was the old story of, of the Hatfields and the McCoys. I think I probably saw a cartoon, a Bugs Bunny thing where maybe it was Yosemite Sam and his descendants or something got into a big fight. I can't remember. And I thought, you know what, I'll just go back and have a look at what the story actually was. And so it was uh, two um, families, one family, the Hatfields, the other family, the McCoy. And they had a land dispute that was going through between the two of them. And the feuding began in 1863. They were both Confederate um, people, uh, so they didn't have a political disagreement. This was strictly a disagreement over uh, land and entitlement. But the upshot of the whole thing was that between uh, 1863 and the trials that finished in 1901, 1863 to 1901, that's almost 40 years, more than a dozen people were murdered on both sides. There was a massacre in that time were all kinds of things that happened back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And from a distance, maybe we can kind of look at it and say, how ridiculous is that? And yet, here we are, right? And yet, here we are, this is what happened. And so many years later, they, they finished all the trials, 1901, and um, many years later, 60 more plus, 60 plus descendants gathered in 2003 from these two families and they actually signed a truce. They signed a truce and created a June 14th Hatfield and McCoy Reconciliation Day. So they wanted to change the story about the idea of those two families symbolizing violence and feuding and fighting and transform it into a story where they remember and this is what they said in their piece. We ask by God's grace and love that we be forever remembered as those that bound together the hearts of two families to form a family of freedom in America. It's never too late for us to extend that loving heart and that forgiveness. And for, you can imagine generations, that stuff is embedded in each of those families, right? That trauma, we know that from the World War I, World War II, it lives in us. And they were not just mentally, individually willing to set it down, but they were willing to put it in writing. It ends here in our hearts. It ends here in our hearts. So I think that there is a lot to say about the hidden power of forgiveness. It's not about ourselves. It, or pardon me, it is about ourselves and not just the other. It's good for our brain neurologically. It can help us get through situations that we otherwise wouldn't think that we could. It expands our ability to engage in those courageous conversations. And we are being called into having those courageous conversations more and more. And if we can't do it, who's going to do it? It's up to us to try and do this thing. And yeah, I find it really challenging. In my own family, my family of historic separation, we just leave continents 
to get away from conflict and we leave marriages to get away from conflict and it goes on and on and on. That's how we specialize, ultimate passive aggressive behavior, I guess. And so we stand up and we start to have those courageous conversations. Demands that we lead into our higher self to find what I call the middle way and the path that only happens and only opens when we let go of the concepts of right and wrong. So I'm just gonna end with a closing story. Um, some of you know that I have a bit of a Buddhist practice in addition. And this is from somebody that I've actually been following since I was in high school, if you can believe it. He's now passed on, made his transition, but he is truly a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, he, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was Buddhist, but now that I think about it, I can't really remember, but you'll know him for sure. It's Ram Das, and it's from his book, How Can I Help? And the story is called Heaven and Hell. And so a burly, rough samurai went to see a monk of small stature. Monk, he said to him, in the tone of the voice of one who is accustomed to being instantly obeyed, teach me something about heaven and hell. And the monk looked at this mighty warrior and replied with utmost disdain, teach you something about heaven and hell? I couldn't teach you anything. You're dirty. You smell bad. Your sword is rust. You're a disgrace a disgrace to the lineage of samurai. Get out of here, I can't stand you. The samurai became enraged. He trembled and his face reddened. Mute with anger, he drew his sword and raised it ready to kill him. That is hell, the monk told him softly. The samurai shuddered at the thought of the compassion and submission of this little man who had risked his life to show him hell. Slowly, he lowered his sword, full of gratitude, and suddenly at peace. And that is heaven, the monk told him so. So let's move into prayer. I invite you to just take a deep breath and just bring that loving presence that you are, that divine self that you are right here and right now. Just bring it into your awareness. Perhaps it sits in your heart. Perhaps it sits in your crown chakra. Perhaps it sits all around you as you feel and expand into the greater essence of who you are, that sense of beingness that expands beyond your skin. And as you breathe in this beautiful air, this beautiful peace that is right here, right now in this space, I know that love is here. I know that love is alive and well, that it is that expression of goodness, that expression and that free flow of peace and understanding. I know that each one of us here is filled with the idea and the concept and the experience and expression of compassion. I know that love lights the pathway forward. And I know that we courageously step into that path in our ever evolving experience of life, knowing that we are divine expressions of that one, that one mind consciousness, and that we recognize and see that one mind reflected back to us through hearts, through minds, through whispers, through still moments. We see with our heart, mind, and so I allow this to be the truth that is, knowing that it is the fullest expression offered here in this moment. And I allow it to expand and grow within my being in gratitude and faith, knowing that the law is already underway, ever flowing with ever goodness. And so it is. Thank you, everyone. But if you've been nourished with our gathering, as well as our weekly and monthly programs, including circles, know that any gifts of all sizes are welcomed, that what a lovely demonstration of the law of circulation to receive and to give, and know that your contribution makes a difference, a positive difference. 
So knowing that you can donate in uh, three different ways, you can give online, but if that doesn't work for you, you can also mail us a check or send us an e-transfer. And all of this is Nancy, I think is putting in the Zoom chat for us. So thank you, yep, there it is. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for that today. And all everything that everybody has done today has been fabulous. So now I ask you to join me in declaring our prosperity affirmation. Divine love within blesses and multiplies all that we have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is.